Hi, welcome to the lecture video for Module 5. Today we'll be talking about the art of late antiquity and the art of Byzantium. So just a couple of things that we'll be covering today included these major changes that occurred in the Roman Empire under the Emperor Constantine, and I'll be explaining who he is as well. Under his reign, we see the significant rise of the Christian religion. Uh, so we'll be talking about a number of Christian monuments and how Christian art changes from before and after when it became legal in the Roman Empire. We'll also talk about the art and architecture of the Eastern version of the Roman Empire, centered around the city of Constantinople, formerly called Byzantium. And finally, we'll talk quite a bit about this Byzantine ritual and devotion, because interaction with religious objects and religious spaces was very, very important to the Byzantines. So let's go ahead and get started. As always, I'm starting with this map so you can see where we're talking about today. For the most part, we're going to be talking about things in both the city of Rome, so you're familiar with that is, but also the city of Constantinople, which you can see right here. One monument we'll be looking at today actually comes from Egypt. It's found at a monastery in Mount Sinai, which is very near to the Red Sea. Unfortunately, that's not indicated precisely on this map. So you'll remember last lecture, I ended with ancient Rome by talking about what's called the Tetrarchy. Remember, this is when Diocletian divided the empire. When he divided the empire in this way, there were four capital cities. They were actually situated in Milan, Italy, Trier, Germany, Thessaloniki, Greece, and Nicomedia in Turkey. All of these sites had major building projects because they were these important administrative centers. So after we talk about Constantine and a couple of his monuments in Rome, we'll be moving into the Eastern Roman Empire. That is what we now call the Byzantine Empire, typically. So here is a large-scale portrait bust of the Emperor Constantine. He was the son of one of the Tetrarchs named Constantius Chlorus, who was Diocletian Caesar in the West. Remember, the Caesar was the head emperor who was training the Augustus, who would eventually take over when the Caesar would retire. The first succession of the Tetrarchs did not go well. There was a battle between Maxentius and Constantine, a very famous battle called the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, took place just north of the city of Rome. This happened in the year 312 CE. Constantine was said to have had a vision the night before the battle and that he heard a voice telling him to put the sign of Christ on his banners. Uh, and that symbol in particular was something called the Chi Rho, which is the first two initials of Christ in Greek. And this becomes an important symbol for Constantine. And I'll, we'll have some examples of that later on in the lecture so you can see it there. So shortly after Constantine took full power of the entire Roman Empire away from Maxentius, previously they had divided it, the following year he issued what was called the Edict of Milan. And this is an important moment for you to remember. The Edict of Milan in 313 CE, and it was something that granted freedom to all religious groups, actually not just Christianity. Most people talk about that's the moment when, it, when Christianity became legal. Instead, it just gave freedom to all religious groups. A lot of people will say that Constantine wasn't really much of a Christian, and they'll use the excuse that he was baptized on his deathbed. Uh, actually, at that point in time, a lot of Christians were baptized on their deathbed. It's a sort of way of making sure you can't do anything else wrong before you die. What is very likely, though, is that he just added Christianity to his arsenal of devotion. That is, the Romans often were very additive with their religions, so they might worship Jupiter. They might pay particular attention to Isis or Mithras, and so it seems like maybe he was adapting Christ in that way. Although we do know that he had some major building projects related to Christianity, and also his mother and his daughter were both active Christians. One of, the other major things to, one of the other major things to know about Constantine, besides the fact that he is this first Christian emperor, is that he decided to move the capital from the city of Rome to the city he named for himself called Constantinople. It's a port city that is now modern-day Istanbul. Rome ceases to be the capital, and that is really what triggers the eventual decline of so here's a different view of this colossal portrait head of Constantine. This is actually the very same head. What it actually is is a fragment from a much larger statue, a colossal statue, because it is well over life size. It originally was made out of both marble and bronze and had a wooden framework. 
and seated, it would have been more than 30 feet high. Here's a reconstructed view incorporating the surviving fragments with what the sculpture is thought to have looked like. So in that previous view, we weren't even seeing all of these fragments. Today, they're displayed in the courtyard of a Roman museum, and they're sort of set up all over the courtyard, so you can't see them all at once. This is not the first monumental statue that we have. Um, remember, I talked about the Colossus of Nero, which is what the Col Colosseum is named for. We have more fragments of this colossal statue in particular than most. It survives better than most earlier colossal statues. So the pieces we have remaining are his head, his right hand pointing to the sky, the joint of his bicep and his elbow of his right arm, part of his chest on the right side, the right kneecap, part of the right shin, and then elements of both feet, although you'll see they're quite different. What's very interesting about this statue is that we know exactly where it came from. It had a very particular place. It actually stood in one of the basilicas in Rome. Now remember, a basilica in ancient Rome is typically a law court, and it would actually stand in for the emperor himself. It was in this basilica started by Maxentius, and then Constantine finished it or restored it and attached his name to it. This statue would have sat in one of the apses. Remember, the apse is the semicircular extension on one end, which is the focal point of the basilica. And so any business that needed to take place in front of the emperor could take place instead in front of the statue. So if, the, if Constantine was in Constantinople or elsewhere in the empire and business needed to happen, they could do so in front of this image of the emperor because the image actually stood for the emperor. I think it's a really good example of how powerful images could be. So it's the sort of, not exactly a propaganda piece, but one that had this distinct connection to the emperor. You might recall the Augusta Suprema Porta when looking at this statue because he's recalling that orator pose that the Augusta Suprema Porta was in. So you now can maybe understand after seeing the Constantine sculpture, the Augusta Suprema Porta, and the Marcus Aurelius that Roman emperors like to show themselves addressing the crowd. They like to show themselves in this way, hailing the viewer or the visitor. But just imagine how powerful this image would be. So in his other hand, the reconstruction of this shows him holding an orb, which is a sign of dominion. And we're not quite sure what his clothing would have been, but we know he was bare-chested to a certain extent. So that probably gave him an association with the gods. So not, as, not only is he this enormous emperor, but he is also being associated with the gods. And that's a very important thing for an emperor, because that is how you gain some of your power. The very large scale means that it's somewhat schematic, so a lot has been reduced because of the scale. It's not that detailed or naturalistic. Remember, the same thing happened with those colossal statues of Ramses II that we talked about. It has this very distinctive portrait face, though. He had this hooked nose and this very heavy jaw. It does contain some features of the tetrarchic style. It's somewhat abstract and stylized, so the proportions are maybe a little bit off. What's interesting also is it's thought that this head was probably a different portrait of an emperor before it became Constantine. That is, after Constantine came to power, he recarved this colossal head, which probably depicted one of his predecessors. So it's this series of portraits in this same image. This is not the only example of this in ancient Rome. Actually, that Colossus of Nero is known to have undergone some changes as well when later emperors wanted their faces associated with it. What I'm showing you here is a photograph, an aerial photograph taken of Vatican City. Right in the center of it, you see the largest basilica in the world. And now I'm using this new meaning of the word basilica in that it is a Christian church where the Pope says mass. This is the Basilica of St. Peter's that stands just on the edge of the city of Rome. It's this monumental Renaissance and Baroque structure. And if you go to Rome, this is what you will visit today. However, a church has stood on that site for much, much longer than since the Renaissance. It was actually founded by Constantine himself. This is a view, a reconstruction view, of what old St. Peter's, as built by Constantine, probably looked like. So before I go into this architecture, I want to talk for a few minutes about some of the basic concepts of Christianity. I'm going to assume that you don't know much about it, just as I am with any religion that we'll talk about, although primarily this semester we'll be discussing Christian images. 
So Christianity is co composed around the idea of the Trinity, that there is God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who is often symbolized as a dove. The ritual of Christian Mass is centered around what's called the Eucharist, or Holy Communion, where the bread and the wine served at this Eucharist stands for the body and blood of Christ. This word Eucharist comes from the Greek word for thanksgiving. So the Eucharist is supposed to represent the sacrifice that Christ made for the expiation of everyone's sins, so that Christ's death on the cross saved everyone from sin. The early Christian church, which we'll be talking about quite a bit today, was divided into geographical centers around the Mediterranean. This is a result of the teachings of the apostles. These were the followers of Christ who spread out around the Mediterranean following his death. They're organized into what are called dioceses, and there's a certain hierarchy so that there's an archbishop who's in charge of several dioceses. Then there's a bishop below him who is in charge of a single diocese. And below that is a priest who is in charge of a single parish. And it takes several parishes to make a diocese. The Pope is the highest of all, and all of the popes considered themselves descended from St. Peter, who, according to the New Testament of the Christian Bible, Christ handed the keys of heaven to St. Peter and said that he was meant to lead his flock, that he was going to build the church on Peter, on the rock. The name Peter means rock. Christianity is organized around the holy book called the Bible, the Bible is considered to be the Word of God. It's composed of the Old and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the Hebrew book. The New Testament has the teachings and the life of Christ. Christians were Jews who believed that Christ was the Messiah, the Savior. Before 313, when Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, Christianity was illegal. Now, actually, the Romans were quite open to religions. They had this very additive approach that I was talking about with Constantine, but you had to acknowledge that the emperor was divine and make a ritual sacrifice to him. Christians would not do that. So they became enemies of the state. They didn't acknowledge the authority of the emperor. And this is why you hear about so many persecutions of the Christians, so many martyrdoms happening, and you know, the and you know, the the things about the Christians being thrown to the lions in the Colosseum. It's because they were enemies of the state. You refuse to sacrifice to the Roman gods, then you are breaking. So now let's talk about this image. This is what we call Old St. Peter's Basilica. So the aerial view I showed you generally is called New St. Peter's or more often just called St. Peter's in general. And it's built on top of the exact site where Constantine built this church. It dates from about 320 to 327 CE. So well after Constantine had been emperor for quite some time. Remember, he becomes emperor in 312. This is our first example of imperial Christianity or commissions related to imperial Christianity. It's the first monumental church structure and it's based on a specific Roman building type, which actually lends the name that we use for churches today, a basilica. So as I said, St. Peter was given the job of minding Christ's flock by Christ himself once he knew that he was going to die. Originally, his name was Simon, and he was renamed Peter, as I said, it means rock, because he was the rock upon which Christ built his church. The apostle Peter eventually came to Rome and was executed there himself, was martyred there in Christian parlance. And he was buried in a cemetery below the site that became St. Peter. So there was this pre-existing cemetery. Many different kinds of people were buried there, not just Christians, some Romans, some of other religions. And since Peter was buried there, and there had been a shrine to him ever since his death, Constantine decided that this was the most appropriate place to build his first major monument to imperial Christianity. So since Peter is in Rome, that is why Rome claims leadership of the Christian church. Actually, for many, many years, and even today to a certain extent, you might hear of some other popes sometime. For example, there was a pope in Alexandria, Egypt. There was a pope in Constantinople. Uh, so there were some struggles over who had primacy over the church, but Rome has pretty much won out there. Since this was the since this was the first monumental construction of a church building and this manifestation of imperial Christianity, it really came to establish the model for churches. And at the same time, it established the dominance of the Bishop of Rome, who is the Pope, over all others.
So the layout of a Christian basilica, what we're seeing here down below, especially in the plan, it's inspired by Roman basilicas. So here, for example, I'm showing you the ground plan again of the Forum of Trajan. Specifically, I want you to look at the Basilica Ulpia right here. Remember, this, we looked at some reconstructions of this space. It was the law court. You have apses on either end, which is where the judge would sit. It was the focal point. So this long rectangular hall supported by columns with an apse became the model for Christian churches. They can hold a lot of people, and they have a distinctive focal point. So that was very important for the Christians. So as you see here in the plan of Old St. Peter's, you have this very large rectangular hall supported by columns, and we can see it here in this cutaway reconstruction as well. You have this higher piece in the middle. Remember, even in an ancient Roman basilica, the center area is referred to as the nave. We call these spaces between the columns the aisles in both the plan and the reconstruction here. Here we have the apse, which is where the altar was located and in Christian churches still is located. The major addition to the Roman Basilica is this space, which we call the transept. And you see it here in this reconstruction drawing. So it's got the same height as the nave. It sort of continues that space of the nave. But notice the shape that the church takes on with the addition of a transept. It becomes a cross shape. And this is an important symbol for Christians. And so this type of plan would be called a Latin cross plan because a Latin cross is the one with the T-bar up rather high rather than straight in the middle. That's referred to as a Greek cross instead. So the transept provided additional space for not only the people attending services, but also for the clergy and for any pilgrims who were coming to visit the tomb of St. Peter. So as I mentioned, there had been a shrine at the tomb of St. Peter since his death. And people would go to visit it, go to visit his bones, the relics, because they thought that it had a certain power that perhaps you could be healed or that would take some of your time off of purgatory. So pilgrims, we'll talk a lot about pilgrims, especially in our next lecture after this. Christians would travel to go visit these holy relics. And since the apse was the focal point, this is where the altar was contained, but the altar is actually marking something even more important. The altar is placed directly over the burial of St. Peter. So the entire church is organized so that the focal point is directly on top of the holiest relic in the church. Here I'm showing you the various layers of the site. So the slope that you see here that runs diagonally from the top right down to the lower left, that was the ground level of the Vatican Hill. That's why it's called Vatican City. That city, that hill was called the Vatican Hill. And so Constantine had to level that out to a certain extent. And here you see the ground floor level of the Constantinian Basilica. Actually part of the cemetery that Peter was buried in, part of it was above ground. So that's why you see his tomb actually above the ground level. And then directly on top of that, almost a thousand years later, the Renaissance popes built a new basilica, and you can see that it's a bit above the ancient one. So if you go to St. Peter's today, you can visit some of these lower spaces, and you can see different foundation blocks and column bases of the original basilica. You can even go visit the necropolis, the city of the dead, where St. Peter is buried. It's well worth doing if you're planning a trip to Rome. And here, just one more comparison. I want to make sure that you see the impact that Roman architecture had on Christian architecture. So I talked specifically about the impact of the Basilica, and the Basilica Ulpia is our best example, but there are many other basilicas. So it's not just this one-to-one -one connection with the Basilica Ulpia or the form of Trajan. But you can see here also how early Christian churches often had a forecourt, a courtyard that you would come into, just like these forums did as well. So this was an important entrance space, this crossing from the outside world into this sort of meditative, almost a cloister-like area that had a fountain in the middle. So you would pass from the outside world into the Christian space. So it's this major transition that would mark it, just like Trajan did with his forum. It's actually quite similar. So now what I'd like to do is so now what I'd like to do is talk about a couple of examples of early Christian burial occurred outside of the city walls for hygienic reasons. And that's true of the city of Rome, but also for lots and lots of other cities of the Roman Empire. The Romans themselves cremated their bodies, so there were not bodies for burials. 
that the Christians wanted their bodies to be ready for the afterlife, for the second coming of Christ, when their bodies would rise again and they would be made perfect. So to cremate was it in some ways seen as a desecration of that body that they needed for that second resurrection. So the people who were not wealthy were buried underground in what we now call catacombs. And a catacomb is an underground city of the dead, or I use this word once already before, a necropolis. The interiors of these catacombs were filled with burial niches. And often inside these niches called loculi, they would insert bodies directly and then they would sometimes cover them over with plaster where they would then write the person's name on it or sometimes if they were a little wealthier they would cover it with marble instead. Other spaces were called cubicula and they were small rooms that belonged to wealthy families and this is where family members sarcophagi would be kept so often these sarcophagi that survived were found in the catacombs themselves. So these, these underground burial spaces if you're a more wealthy person, you're going to have nicer funerary art because it commemorates the dead body. We're the same way today, actually. If you go to any cemetery, the larger monuments cost a lot more money. It's a way to commemorate your dead. So the catacombs, there's this idea, this myth that developed that they were used as secret hiding places by persecuted Christians. That's not entirely true. Christians would perform rituals there. They might do funerary rituals. They might go back to have worship or a Eucharist there or go back to commemorate their dead. They didn't just leave the bodies there and never come back again. In fact, the, in fact, these catacombs were used for people of many different religions, including Christians, Jews, and even pagans. So one thing we're going to talk about with the next couple of images are these religious symbols used by people that are both in and out of the religion to construct their identity for the afterlife. So these images held certain meanings for Christians, and that's why they're being selected. So what I'm showing you here is an early Christian sarcophagus that was found in a church in Rome called Santa Maria Antiqua. It's from the 4th century, and it's made of marble. There's a lot going on here, and I want to go over what the imagery here is telling us. So let's start from the left side, and we'll work our way across. So on the left side here, we see part of the story of Jonah. Now Jonah, Jonah's story is from the Old Testament, and often Christians would see the Old Testament as a parallel or an allegory for the New Testament, showing that there was a plan from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And making these comparisons is called typological exegesis. So you're deriving similar types. You're putting different types together, old and new. So for example, Jonah was seen as a parallel for the story of Christ. God called Jonah to go to a city called Nineveh that he did not want to go to. He was a prophet. And so instead of going to Nineveh, he jumped on a boat, which we can see over here on the far left. And God knew he was on the boat because he's God and causes a great storm to come up around the ship. All of the sailors are losing their minds because they're afraid their boat is going to capsize. Finally, Jonah owns up to what he's done. and He says, okay, throw me off the ship. This is my fault. So in the story, Jonah's thrown overboard, and then he's swallowed by a sea monster. Often in English translations, people say a whale, but it's really not that clear. So here we're seeing this little sea monster instead of a whale. Jonah spends three days in the belly of the sea monster, and he's released repentant and unscathed three days later, which is very much like the story of Christ's death and resurrection. So according to Christian narrative in the New Testament, Christ is crucified, he's buried for three days, and then he rises again from the dead with his body perfectly intact. So you can kind of see why Christians saw that as a parable of Christ's death and resurrection which the resurrection is everlasting life awaiting true believers. So you can also see why the Christians wanted that from, for themselves. The story of Jonah becomes a very popular subject for the catacombs because after death, Christians are hoping to be resurrected themselves. It's a different approach to the afterlife than something like the Egyptians or even the Romans themselves, but it's this hope for everlasting life after death in the same way as the Egyptians. Next to Jonah in the center here, we have a female 
with her arms raised in the air. And she's actually a Roman muse, but she's dressed in a Roman toga. And she's standing in a very particular pose called an orant pose. She has her arms raised, which sort of resembles Christ's arms stretched out on the cross. But it's this very common symbol of worship or perhaps it's supposed to be representing perpetual prayer. And you see behind her these two trees. Anytime you see wood in this context, it's supposed to evoke the wood of the cross. This figure in a toga is supposed to be sort of like a Roman poet. He's got a scroll that he's opening up and reading, but instead of being someone like Virgil, who wrote this epic poem, he's instead supposed to be reading a religious text. So there's this adaptation of Roman types. This is called syncretism, where they borrow earlier imagery and invest new meaning into it. The next thing we see, the next figure we see is a figure called the Good Shepherd. And we'll talk a little bit more about him in just a minute. But the Good Shepherd was this symbol of Christ where the shepherd holds his sheep and carries him and takes care of him. He's also dressed quite classically on this side. And then finally, we have the figure of John the Baptist. And he is baptizing this Christian here uh, with the dove of the Holy Spirit coming down because in the story of Christ's baptism, John the Baptist baptized Christ and he saw the Holy Spirit descend. And that's how John the Baptist knew that Christ was the Messiah. And a baptism was the way that Christians believed they would acquire this ability to enter the Christian afterlife. So a baptism is another very important symbol that you see in early Christianity. So here we see how early Christians used art to make statements about religion, rising from the dead, baptism, etc. Art is not just decoration in this context. These are tools for worship, tools for identity construction, and many images like this appear even before Christianity is legalized. Actually, the images before Christianity is legalized are even more coded, where they might be read this figure might be read as just a regular shepherd instead of the good shepherd, for example. This sarcophagus in particular is after Christianity is legalized, so it's a bit more explicit in its imagery. The next image I'm showing you also comes from a catacomb. This is from the catacomb of Priscilla in Rome, and this dates to the 2nd or 3rd century CE. This is the central image in a larger painting. Actually, it's surrounded by scenes from the story of Jonah as well, but your book just chooses to reproduce this figure. What we have here is that good shepherd, just like we saw on the sarcophagus just a moment ago. This is actually a very particular adaptation of a Greek and Roman type. Here, for example, I'm comparing a Greek calf bearer, which was found on the Acropolis in Athens. So you can actually, hopefully you can tell that it's archaic. Look how stylized the face and hair are. But this was this very common type for the Greeks representing the shepherd. It was also a popular subject in ancient Rome where they formed part of garden statuary, forming a sort of bucolic landscape around the wealthy Romans who had these gardens. So they would feel like they were out in nature. But to Christians, the good shepherd is Christ. Christ is the shepherd of God's flock. In the catacomb image, Christ carries a goat on his shoulders, and down below he has a sheep and a goat on either side. This probably refers to the, sta this probably refers to the statement in the New Testament that Christ would separate the sheep from the goats, the good. On either side of him, there are two trees, probably meant to recall the wood of the cross, and you have birds and trees on either side. So this image could very easily be read by a non-Christian as a classicizing Roman image. And this actually dates early enough that we could argue that, that perhaps the Christians were afraid of who might see it. So they're using this coded imagery that would not get them in trouble. So the Good Shepherd becomes this important symbol of compassion and becomes even incorporated into the Christian liturgy, that is the actual religious practice. The priest comes to be seen as the Good Shepherd the congregation as the flock. So now I'd like to move on to the other part of our lecture today, and that is dealing with Byzantine art. The early Christian and the Byzantine periods overlap quite a bit. Specifically, I'm talking about the 5th and the 6th century. But the Byzantine world is what's happening in the eastern part of the empire. After Constantine moves the capital from Rome to Constantinople, the Roman emperors stay there. And even though we now call them Byzantines, for almost a millennium, they still considered themselves Roman, even though they were in the city of Constantinople. They called themselves Roman. They tried to act like Romans. Here I'm showing you a famous ivory depicting the emperor Justinian, 
You should notice that he's on horseback, an equestrian portrait, just like we saw in ancient Rome. And while I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this imagery, I do, about this image, I want to point out a couple of things. At the top, for example, we have an image of a youthful Christ. He's holding a cross and a staff, making a gesture of blessing. And he's, a, he's almost a sort of image that these two angels are flying in. Above all is Christ, but below him, the largest figure, is the emperor. So we can see this as him being overseen by Christ. But Justinian, because he's a Christian, but he's also a Roman, so he adapts Roman imagery as well. So we have the equestrian portrait, like I mentioned. Think of Marcus Aurelius. We also have this little victory figure who would have been flying in, holding a wreath to crown him. So the Byzantines were Roman Christians, and that is how they considered themselves. There does become a major division of the Christian church in 1054. We're not really going to talk too much about that, but that's how... That's the point when there's a split between the Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Church. So the Byzantine period gets its name from the city Byzantion, which was where Constantine founded his new city of Constantinople. The, when I say the word Byzantine, it refers to the empire that stretched across the Mediterranean starting from Constantinople. Justinian I, who I'm showing you in this ivory, is associated with what we call the early Byzantine period. It's in the 6th century that Byzantium reaches its height under the Emperor Justinian and the Empress Theodora. The Middle Byzantine period goes from 843 to 1204 when Constantinople is captured by the Fourth Crusaders. And the late Byzantine period starts with the restoration of Byzantine rule until the fall of the empire to the Ottoman Turks from 1261 to 1453. Some of the major art forms in Byzantium are architecture, manuscripts, mosaics, ivory carvings, and icons, and we'll be talking about a couple of different types of things today. Justinian had a so-called golden age. This is when the Eastern Empire prospered. During this golden age, while Constantinople and the east part of the empire prospered, Italy was overrun with barbarians. Byzantine culture and wealth was at its height under this emperor, and he ruled from 527 to 565 CE. They had control of most Mediterranean trade, and the empire extended well into Europe. The only war was with Persia on the fringes of the empire, and instead of dealing with a war, Justinian just bought them off because he was wealthy enough to do so. Now, the major monument in the city of Constantinople, now Istanbul, is this church called Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia means holy wisdom, and it was a church commissioned by that emperor Justinian. It's a very important monument of early Byzantine architecture. It was designed and built over five years by Anthemius, who was a mathematician, and Isidorus, who was a physicist. Notice that they are not architects. It's a very interesting thing. It's highly skilled architectural work. These were intellectuals who, since they weren't trained as architects, they were able to do something completely new. They were able to reconceive a church space. What we see here is actually a hybrid plan. It's a central plan combined with a basilica plan, and it's topped by this incredible dome. So here I'm showing you a plan. So here I'm showing you a plan of the building. You can get a sense of how it is centrally planned, and I read any central plan buildings yet, but that just means the focus is on the center of the space. It's typically a circle, a square, or an octagon. Here we have this enormous square, but they've maintained this axial structure of a basilica plan right in the center here. You can see that this dome has been placed on top of a square, and it's illustrating this union of the centralized and the longitudinal basilica structures. So these are formerly exclusive architectural traditions, but they're brought together in this context. It has quite an unembellished exterior, and its interior has changed quite a bit. I'll show you some views of that in just a moment. There has been one major change made to this building, and those are the four minarets that you see at each corner. So after Constantinople was taken over by the Ottoman Empire and the name changed to Istanbul, it was turned into a mosque. Today it is a museum, and which is why we can look at a lot of the Christian images inside this, because as, as it was turned into a mosque, all of the mosaics and everything, anything with Christian imagery was co covered over. So it's quite the change to go from the outside to the inside of the space, from this unembellished exterior into this glittering golden environment that focuses on walls and floors of exotic colored stone and 
as much light admitted into the space as possible. There's this idea of a mystical quality of the light. You can see as you enter into the space how different it is from the world outside. And here's a large overview of the interior here. This mystical quality of light is meant to affect the visitor, appearing to transform a material reality of the regular world into a spiritual vision. The worshipers rise up from this earthly world to the spiritual world, which was, which was a goal of a lot of Christian architecture and liturgy. There's this incredible illusion that the dome is resting on this halo of light as it has these very small windows that make up the entire base of it. So a number of these things I'd like you to try to ignore if possible. These large roundels that have Arabic text, these are all from when it was converted into a mosque, as well as this text written around the lantern of the dome here. That's not original to Justinian's church. The scale of Hagia Sophia rivals the architectural accomplishments of the Romans, such as the Pantheon and some of the basilicas in the city of Rome itself. It's this enormous structure, not made out of steel, like we're used to seeing in today's world, and it's not primarily of concrete either. The diameter of the dome is 108 feet, and it stands 180 feet high. So the dome isn't quite as large as that of the Pantheon, but it's a lot higher up, so it appears larger. It's a real feat of engineering, the dome itself, but also the entire building. The dome actually collapsed in 558, so not too long after this was constructed, and later they added buttresses to the exterior. Buttresses are, are large masonry structures that support the thrust of the walls and the dome. It uses these enormous piers to hold up all of this weight, but they wanted it to appear weightless. So the piers are rather funny shaped. They look like corners between spaces. So here, for example, I'm showing you those piers. Those are these huge structures right here, enormous. Piers are supporting mechanisms. You need the strongest ones at the base of a dome because a dome is hard to contain architecturally. The thrust of it, it wants that gravity wants to get down to the ground as efficiently as possible, and it's very easy for domes to spread their walls out. But these enormous piers support it. But the way they're formed, they just look like corners to go from one space to another. There's very distinctive space. There's very distinctive spaces. So around the base of the dome there are 40 windows that make it look like it's floating. It's using what's called pendentive construction. There's a couple of different methods for putting round domes on square bases like this is. And that's what where these things come in. Pendentives look kind of like big triangles, almost sail-like. And by making an arch between the neighboring piers and then building these pendentive structures that was able to support this dome. This is the first use of pendentives on a monumental scale. Like the Romans, at Hagia Sophia the architects were interested in shaping space, but there's something new going on here. So structurally or in scale it may look Roman, but it's actually very, very different. In the Pantheon, for example, the dome sits directly on top of the circular wall versus this more challenging pendentive construction. The walls are actually concealed piers, so instead of it looking like you've got these huge supporting mechanisms, this is almost an entire wall structure, even though it's perforated with lots and lots of openings. These are more like screen walls. The vaults and the domes are made of brick instead of concrete, and the piers are made out of ashlar masonry, which is carefully cut and shaped blocks of stone fitted together without mortar. And there was a rumor that it was built by angels because it was such a heavenly space. All of the light being admitted to the space draws the eye upward and forward into the primary focal point of the space, which you can see just over here is the main apse. Here's a cutaway view to give you another sense of how this building is put together. So this also gives you a nice sense of just how separated the spaces of the aisles are compared to the big open central area. Here you can also nicely see these screen walls that are quite large. You can see the piers here, but they, it feels very light and open because there's so many openings in the wall. All of the light makes it seem structurally impossible. It's a sort of fantasy of pattern and lightness. When it was constructed, it was the biggest monument in the world at the time. When Justinian saw it, as legend goes, he was supposed to have said, Solomon, I've outdone you. Solomon being the king of Jerusalem from the Old Testament, who built the Temple of Jerusalem, which Titus had sacked in 81 CE. The other really important thing about Hagia Sophia 
is it's Justinian's Palace Church. So this was right next to the Imperial Palace in Constantinople. So it's a statement of his power as the Emperor of the Romans, but it is also this very important site of ceremony and ritual. And the Byzantine Empire was all about ritual. There are these interesting primary sources that talk about visitors going to the Byzantine Empire and just being dazzled by the almost performance that they would put on. For example, there was a uh, one writer who said that he had come into the presence of the emperor who was almost like a fixed image. The emperor didn't move. He was this idea of the emperor. And as he bowed down, this visitor, then he raised his head back up, and all of a sudden the emperor was then 10 feet above him. So he had some sort of mechanism that raised and lowered him to shock and dazzle these viewers to make him seem otherworldly almost. So the Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom, a major imperial structure where Justinian is trying to compete with the Romans and all architecture that had come before. Here's a nice diagram just to give you another idea of this pendentive construction. So you can see it in action here. This photo is kind of strange. It looks like it's elongated the dome a bit. But here you can see it on the square base. And here's with regularly shaped piers instead of the strange ones at Hagia Sophia. And you can see how the pendentives work together to put the dome on top of this strange space. You can even get a sense from this, I think, about how the dome thrusts out to the piers and why it was so important to have such strong piers at Hagia Sophia. This image gives you a sense of the rich material decoration of the interior. So colored marbles on the floors, mosaics on the wall, uh, richly decorated column capitals. Everywhere you looked would be something new to look at. It was this lavish, incredible heavenly space like nothing anyone had ever seen before. Just to remind you what the Greeks and the Romans were using before the Byzantine Empire, here you can see the ornate decoration of what are called basket capitals that we see here, not following some of the standard architectural types, although you can see that they incorporated the volutes here. So now I want to show you this map very briefly so that you can tell where we're moving on with our next monument. Instead of being in Constantinople, our next monument is in the city of Ravenna, which is in what is now northern Italy. In 540, the city of Ravenna was captured by Byzantine forces from the ruling Christian Ostrogoths. This is a tribe from northern Europe. And at that point, the city became a base for conquest of Italy under Justinian in the mid-6th century. Under Justinian, it becomes the administrative center of the West. I want to talk about this monument, the church itself, but also a couple of the images inside. This church is called San Vitale. It was begun in 520 CE, so even, even before the Byzantine conquest of the space. And the mosaics that I'm going to show you are from very shortly after Justinian was able to conquer the Ostrogoths in 540. The mosaics I'll show you are from 546 to 48 CE. This is a very good example of a centrally planned building, and although I'm not showing you the floor plan, I think you can get a sense of that. You have this octagonal structure with a dome on top. Here we're looking at the apse end. You can see how this could possibly be the focal point. There's a couple of small chapels that come off either side, and this is the main focal point of worship. So people would enter in through the side, and they would come into the center space and be directed in this way. Here's a view of the interior. This church was commissioned not by the emperor, but instead by the bishop of Ravenna named Ecclesius and it was dedicated to the 4th century Roman martyr St. Vitalis. Here we're looking towards the sanctuary apse. I was just showing you that view from the exterior. And this is covered in mosaic decoration. It's actually interesting. If you go to this church today, most of the church's decoration is from the 18th century, and it is very ugly compared to everything else you see in the apse. You can also see how richly decorated the lower part of the church is here in these amazing marble panels that have been organized to create these fabulous patterns. And you can see sort of similar capitals to what was being used uh, in Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. But here is our focal point, and this area is all decorated in the 6th century. These mosaics are different manifestations of the Word of God. At the very center of the apse, we have Christ in majesty. It's a very youthful Christ. He sits on the globe of the world. In one hand, he holds a scroll with seven seals. And these symbols, him sitting on the world in the scroll with seven seals, shows him as the Christ of the second coming. Above, you can actually see these incredible clouds where it said in Revelation he would descend from the clouds. Below, unfortunately, it's cut off just a little bit. You can see these four rivers. And these were supposed to be the four rivers of paradise. 
He's surrounded by angels on either side. And then here we have the patron saint of the church, St. Vitalis. And on this side, we have the patron of the church, Ecclesias. And see what he's holding right here. He's holding up to Christ. This angel's presenting him to Christ. He's holding, holding up a small model of the church. Now I wanted to show you this image to just give you a sense of how textured mosaics are. So mosaics are made out of small pieces of glass or tile. And these individual pieces are called a tessera. Plural are called tesserae. And this image doesn't quite convey how spectacular these can be. It's rather flat in its coloring. This actually is a detail of one of the images I'll show you in a moment. But you can see how richly colored they are and how much texture they add. They're rather flat, like a painting almost, but they have this dynamism to them that paintings don't, especially when there are golden backgrounds. I want to focus on this image in particular. What I'm showing you here is on the side wall of the apse. So let me go back for just a moment. In this view of the apse, we see the Christ in majesty here. I'm showing you the mosaic that is featured right here on this wall. And even though I'm not going to show it in the slideshow, I'm also going to make reference to the mosaic that's directly across from it right here. So well above the viewer's head, down below Christ. So here I'm showing you the mosaic of the Emperor Justinian. He's the one featured right in the middle here. He is the same emperor that I showed you in that ivory equestrian portrait just a few minutes ago, although he looks quite different here. What's interesting about this mosaic, and the one directly across from it of his wife Theodora, although I'm not showing you that one, it looks very similar to this with lots of attendants around them and the empress in the center. Neither of them participated in the liturgy at San Vitale. They were not there for the dedication of the church. He probably, Justinian probably never even visited Ravenna. So the mosaic is serving sort of as a proxy for the absent ruler. It's a representation that asserts his authority, very much so like the colossal statue of Constantine that would have been in his basilica. In this context, Justinian stands on the right side of Christ. Remember that if you were looking at this mosaic, you would have the Christ in majesty up above. Justinian is down to the right hand of Christ. He's accompanied by a dozen attendants here, which refers to the 12 apostles. We have soldiers over here. They are wearing battle gear. They're carrying lances, and they have this beautiful shield. This symbol right here, see this little P and the X? This is a symbol I mentioned earlier. This is the chi Rho of Christ. This is the symbol that Constantine adopts. And this is the symbol that other emperors use as well. You see it all over the place, actually, in Christian imagery. So it's not just imperial. Here we have some of his court attendants. You can tell this based on their costume. And then we have some church attendants as well. We have three priests. And then we have a bishop, the only one actually identified by an inscription, Maximianus. So that tells us that he probably commissioned this mosaic himself. Notice that there is no movement. This is a statement of the importance of the emperor's position as a servant of Christ and his wealth. They're almost like statues in a way. They're all placed based on formulas. They're all placed based on formulas of precedence and rank. So Justinian in the middle, Bishop Maximianus to his left. The bishop's importance again is, is asserted. But let's talk a little bit about what's going on here. Justinian is holding what's called the patent. And this was the object, the golden plate that would be used during Mass that would hold the bread of the Eucharist. Directly across the apse in the Theodora mosaic, she's actually holding the chalice that would contain the wine. Notice also that Maximianus carries this cross here, this jeweled, lovely golden cross. And then we have these two priests. One is carrying an incense container. The other one is carrying a, litur a liturgical book. So these are very flat. So these are very flat frontal figures. They're not classicizing or fully models. Like they look really flat. You get no sense of the body underneath except for their little feet. The physical body is almost dematerialized except for those heads, which appear to actually be true portraits. They're very distinctive, all except for maybe the soldiers. Everyone else seems to be a portrait. They're almost hovering above the ground. They're not stuck directly on. The golden background is probably meant to evoke a heavenly space, and you see this often with Byzantine imagery. It also sort of dematerializes them, takes them out of the world around you. So you can tell that they're important, that they're distinctive. So there's no realistic indication of setting of any sort. Notice also that the emperor is wearing purple, and so are his court attendants. Remember I talked about with Porphyry that purple is this imperial color. 
So it's this very interesting representation of the emperor, the most important figure in the Byzantine world, present in this space that he didn't ever even visit. So it's supposed to manifest the emperor at this church because of his importance. So the bishops who commissioned these images, Ecclesiastes, the one who commissioned the church, and Maximianus here, are celebrating the emperor and the fact that they're a part of this empire, even though the, the emperor would never have been there himself. So for our final image today, I want to talk about this type called an icon. And this icon comes from St. Catherine's Monastery in Mount Sinai in Egypt and dates to probably the 6th or the 7th century. Now the Byzantines loved images. There are quite a few icons that survive, but we actually know very well that there would have been thousands and thousands more that have been lost over time. Icons were important in devotion, and this word means image. These were thought to have miraculous powers. They were seen as a sort of intermediary, a power object that connected the viewer directly with the depicted saint. So this is supposed to be an image of St. Peter, but if you meditate in front of it, if you pray to it, it's this direct conduit to Peter himself. These were displayed in churches, often in various spaces in the churches, on the choir screen that separated the regular people from the high altar, but also in other spaces in the church. At some point, discomfort arises in the Byzantine Empire with icons as a form of idol, and this is something that Christians struggled with many times in the Byzantine Empire, also much later. They were afraid that these icons became idols, that people were worshiping the icons themselves rather than what they represented. So there was a period of iconoclasm in Byzantium that lasted from 726 to 843. So many, many, many images were destroyed. What is left is only a fraction of what we know must have existed. Many of those that survive come from St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai in Egypt, like the one I'm showing you here. That's because it was part of the Byzantine Empire before iconoclasm. In the period of iconoclasm, it was part of the Ottoman Empire, and so the, the images contained therein were safe. Most often icons are panel paintings, but really they can be any object. They might be sculpture, they might be mosaic, they're any sort of conduit to the saint that it represents. In this image, we have St. Peter, as I said. He's very frontal, much like Justinian was in the mosaic we saw, although he's been modeled a bit more. You get a, a bit of a sense of the body underneath his clothes. He's shown bearded and with a halo, which is a very typical way to show any older saint. Even in the Western tradition, St. Peter is almost always shown with a beard. He carries a long cross in one arm, and that is a symbol of the fact that he was in charge of the church. And in his other hand, he's holding a bunch of keys, which is his very, very common attribute. In the New Testament, Christ gave Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and so that is the most common image you see to help you identify St. Peter. So there's a couple of things being used here to make this seem a little bit more real and a bit less frontal than, say, the Justinian mosaic. For example, I mentioned the modeling of the body, and modeling means trying to show three-dimensional form through light and shade. So you see these folds in the drapery trying to show shadow. You see the shoulders, you see how they curve over his arm. These creases are meant to represent the elbows. But also notice there's a background here. Sometimes icons are shown on gold backgrounds. That's not atypical. But here we have buildings that are receding into space in the back. So there's an attempt to create a realistic space to try to situate him somewhere besides just a heavenly realm. At the very top, we have these three roundels that celebrate a couple of other figures. In the very center, we have Christ. He's easily identifiable by his dark hair and beard, but also by the cross that's behind his head. On the right side, we have an image of the Virgin Mary. And on the left side, we have a, a young man, and it's hypothesized that he might be St. John the Theologian, but we're not really sure about his identity. We don't have enough information to be sure about who he is. The blues and purples and golds that are used here are very characteristically Byzantine, so you often see those in Byzantine icons. We've seen that throughout um, the images I've shown you so far as well. Now I want to talk just for one second more about the state of preservation that it's in. The thing about these icons is they 
are not really static objects. These are objects of devotion and they were very tactile. People would go up and touch them, they would kiss them, and notice all this damage at the bottom. This indicates to me that this was probably hooked onto a stick and processed as icons often were. They would be processed on holy days or if they were trying to defeat a plague or if they were at war. Parading icons through different spaces was seen as a way to make them even more powerful. So icons and images in general in the Byzantine world were vital to devotional life. This was your way to talk directly to St. Peter or whoever the icon was of. If you go into Greek Orthodox churches today, for example, I was in Thessaloniki a few months ago and I went into one of the churches and people still go up and touch and kiss these icons. It's still a very active tradition. So just to recap what we've done today, we talked about Constantine and the rise of Christianity, especially after the Edict of Milan in 313 CE. We also saw the shift to the Eastern Empire. I didn't talk about this much today, but Constantine himself had a lot of major building projects in Constantinople. He even removed statues from all over the Roman Empire, obelisks, columns, all sorts of things, and took them to Constantinople to make this new capital his own city, this new Christian capital. We also talked about these, these ritual we also talked about these ritual and devotional aspects of these objects, of the spaces, of images such as the Justinia mosaic or the icon. These were very active objects representing the emperor or representing a saint so that if you were a viewer of this, if you were a devotee, you would be interacting in the same space at the same time as these holy figures. So now in order to finish up module five, you'll need to take the self-assessment. Also following this, you have a discussion board prompt. Also following this, you have a discussion board prompt where I'm having you watch an episode of what's called the history of the world in 100 objects about another icon. Also, you have a journal entry when I'd like you to compare a couple of different architectural types and also discuss the impact of the Edict to Milan. On Blackboard, you'll find more information about this, of course. And then finally, group two, you are in charge of our vocabulary wiki for this week. So thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in our weekly meeting this week. Thank you.